X. X. Welcome to a bonus edition of the Ellis James and John Robbins podcast. For our terms of use, please visit. I don't know if we have any. The terms of use are sit back, relax, and enjoy. Yes, please. <laughs> um, so this requires some um, somewhat of a setup. Uh, because regular podcast listeners uh, will know that for many weeks, uh, six, 30 weeks, I wrote my own autobiography in the style of Tony Blackburn, in a kind of style that sort of uh, celebrity, slightly self-aggrandising celeb yeah. bio. This, Kim, this doesn't sound as mad and as self-aggrandising as you'd think, actually. Basically, uh, we used to read aloud from Tony Blackburn's autobiography, which is, I think, I think this is fair to say, the funniest book in the English language. It's yeah. called Poptastic. You can get it on Amazon for like a penny or something it's so it is really worth it and then John started writing his autobiography and it's been very popular and we've had loads of emails and texts and tweets asking for us to uh, release them all as a podcast and here it is so yeah this is the first part of a two-parter I think probably the first 15 or so chapters do hope you enjoy it uh, it was always a highlight of my week uh, sitting down and writing it and reading it out to Ellis trying to make the old guy giggle put a bit of a spring in his step a shaft of light into the darkness of his You existence. make it sound like I'm an 80-year-old man in an old people's home and you're like a 20-year-old volunteer. <laughs> you were right, Ellis. Yeah. Uh, so, I hope you enjoy it, folks. Keep safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep safe. For crying out loud. Uh, thank you very much. Enjoy. Goodbye. Ellis James and John Robbins podcast. X. Uh, I decided to. I, I wanted to write the story of me and Ellis's relationship. Um, so obviously, it dates back some time. And I thought, no, that's not good enough, John. Write your entire life story. <laughs> so today, listeners, um, it's time for a new feature: uh, John's autobiography, which is called "A Robin's Amongst the Pigeons." <laughs> <laughs> and um, the first chapter is simply called "Openings," and it deals with my birth and early childhood. So I'm going to read from my autobiography now, the first chapter of A Robin's Amongst the Pigeons. I was born in Southmead Hospital on the 4th of May 1982. Every year on my birthday, cries of May the 4th be with you have rung out across the land. It always gladdens me, but I've never seen Star Wars and don't intend to, as I'm not a 50-year-old man who collects unopened toys. Following my birth, I was whisked away from the unsightly suburb of Southmead to the Britain and Bloom award-winning market town of Thornbury. Previous residents had included Henry VIII and Princess Diana, and as a two-day-old, I'm sure I would have felt it fitting for me to follow in their footsteps. <laughs> but stopping short of the terrible syphilis and bad continental driving that did for both of them respectively. Due to a mixture of good parenting and an unwillingness to mix with some of the more violent elements of the Bristolian pupils at the Castle School, a table-topping comprehensive. <laughs> I've never had a Bristol accent, though I can impersonate three separate Bristolian accents accurately, the second of which has been labelled superb by three separate publications, one of which is not web-based. <laughs> I wouldn't say I was the brightest pupil in my class, but my teachers did, frequently, and as a child, they outranked me in their ability to judge academic excellence. So I guess it's a label that will have to stick. <laughs> to this day, I've never set much stall by awards and would rather not go into detail about my early successes. Suffice to say, 247 commendations speak for themselves. <laughs> Given for exceptional work in a lesson, 10 commendations could be exchanged for a head of year commendations. Three of those could be exchanged for a head teacher's commendation. Though I amassed 247 commendations, equating to 24.7 head of year gongs and 8.23 recurring head teacher awards, a record that still stands to this day, <laughs> I expected no special treatment, save preference in selection for extracurricular activities such as the school magazine and student committee elections. The Castle School in Thornbury nurtured my interests in all fields, and in the case of geography lessons, some actual fields. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to say that as of 2014, only three of my teachers have been arrested for sexual activity with pupils. Out of a batch of around 60, that's not half bad, and I assume well below the national average. But it wasn't all awards, commendations and watching your back in PE. Trouble was just around the corner. You are a weird guy. 
a <laughs> profoundly <laughs> weird guy. Well, that's great, isn't it? It is great. It's very funny. It's very well written. It's a great parody sort of pastiche of Tony Blackburn. But I just love the idea of you writing that. <laughs> In your house on your own. Uh, John, do you want a cup of tea? I'm, I'm busy, sorry. I'm, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm writing my own autobiography in the style of Tony Blackburn for the radio. You've got to keep it XFM in my household, <laughs> mate. X. XFM. It's... There's no... Oh, is there no, no jingle for it. Oh, right, I thought we had a jingle. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, John reads aloud from his autobiography <laughs> written in the style of Tony Blackburn. Yes, uh, folks, it's time for chapter two of A Robin's Amongst the Pigeons. Um, this chapter, I think I'll call it Setting the Vibes, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Here we go. In 1989, my life would change forever. Turning on the television one morning, I saw an advert. Four men were on a train. Then an image showed their faces moulded together like a mad alien. Five letters emboldened the screen. Q, U, E, E and N. <laughs> but this wasn't an advert for Her Majesty. By then she was too old to sing on top of a steam train. <laughs> Though these four men were clearly some kind of royalty. A seed had been planted in my mind. A cord acorn that would soon grow into a rock oak. By 1992, I was a fully paid-up member of the official International Queen fan club, and my first purchase, a baseball cap and T-shirt, <laughs> meant you could tell this from a distance of over 20 yards. <laughs> I was lost in a world of badges, posters and picture discs, and at times it was too much for my young mind to bear. On buying a limited-edition gold CD of the News of the World album on my 12th birthday, I burst into tears <laughs> in HMV. But by 1995, the school bullies had cottoned onto my obsession. Who was this guy? And what were these crazy new sounds he was into? They couldn't compute. The only calculation they could manage were fists plus robins equals pride restored. <laughs> People often ask me how I was able to maintain academic excellence under such extreme pressure. I simply look them dead in the eyes and say, I've paid my dues time after time. I've done my sentence but committed no crime, and they usually let it drop. <laughs> From time to time, I use Facebook to check in on some of my old foes, and it does help ease the pain to see a St George's flag as their profile picture, grammatically incorrect news of their fifth child, or, in one case, the loss of a limb. <laughs> if they block me, I simply set up another fake account. Great days. <laughs> there you go. What I love is... Bitterness plus bullying plus queen equals Robin's great comedy. <laughs> <laughs> so what what were they doing on the train? Oh, it was the video for um, Breakthrough, where they're singing on a steam train. Oh. The Miracle Express. Oh, right, 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 right. Because uh, I, obviously I hadn't heard that, and when you were talking about um, a train in 1989, I thought... Michael Palin's around the world in 80 <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I know John likes comedy. Actually, Ellis, I've just realised there's a mistake in my autobiography. Oh. It wasn't 1989. Was it 87? No, it was 89. I'm sure the miracle is 89. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course it is. Of course it is. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Everyone's fine. <laughs> Everyone's fine. I'm Everyone's fine. fine. John's good. John's do you, good. Do you ever check up school bullies on Facebook to see how they're doing? Uh, yeah, from time to time. It's phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, it is great. X. X. It's now time for our uh, new feature. It's John Reads Aloud from his own autobiography. Folks, it's <laughs> chapter three. Uh, last week we dealt with... Um, what did we deal with last week? My burgeoning love of Queen, yeah. I think. Uh, this week I begin uh, secondary school, and this chapter is entitled Farthings from Heaven. <laughs> In 1994, I began secondary school. Though armed with a fashionable mullet hairdo, I needed an icebreaker. I'd been collecting commemorative coins for some time, but a medallion marking Victoria's Jubilee wouldn't cut the mustard at big boy school. <laughs> On my weekly trip to the antiques fair, I had a brainwave. I must go currency. I had to face facts. Commemoratives were a dying market, and I needed to tap into the zeitgeist of currency coin collecting. I surveyed my options. Groats were too expensive and had a sporadic minting history. Florins didn't capture my imagination. Pennies were too ungainly. And half pennies, well, I didn't want to be that guy. <laughs> my eyes rested on a small group of farthings. It was love at first sight. Or should I say, first farthing. I was sure the older... <laughs> 
I was sure the older teenagers would have more impressive collections of pre-decimal coins. I could be competing with owners of Charles II coinages. But by my first day, I had a dozen or so belters and marched off to school ready to make waves. As I approached the gates, I saw a boy, maybe 14. He towered over me and had a more fashionable bag. But I had an ace up my sleeve, and more importantly, a display case of farthings in my hand. <laughs> hey there, I said. What? He snarled. <laughs> Want to check out my 1754? The condition is pretty impressive. He pushed me to the ground and walked away. What had I done wrong? Was 1754 too common a date? Was he into crowns? <laughs> my mind raced. I stuffed the case into my millet's rucksack and headed to class. I soon realised I was way ahead of my time. Not only were there no farthing collectors, there wasn't a numismatist in the school. They were stuck in the dark ages of Nintendo Game Boys and getting off with girls. My time would surely come. <laughs> 20 years hence, and I've still to meet a fellow coin collector. In that time, unsurprisingly, the country has seen a steady moral decline. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next time you see youths causing trouble on public transport, hand them a copy of Spink's Coins of England and a local listings magazine, which is bound to contain all the relevant information about their nearest coin fair. Well, thank you, John. <laughs> there we go. Chapter 3. Chapter I the third. I cannot wait for chapter four. <laughs> I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to that bit on the podcast more than once. So. <laughs> Such an insight into the darkness of Robbins. <laughs> FM. Ellis James and John Robbins on XFM podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is part four. The unfair sex question mark is the title of it. On starting secondary school, I knew the only way to impress the ladies was to throw myself into projects such as the school magazine, chess club and the debating team. At 12, I became the youngest ever student representative on the school council. In this revered post, I was responsible for bridging the gap between student body and teaching staff. This unique position of power made me something of an enigma to the opposite sex. They were rarely brave enough to approach me, but often groups of them would point, giggling affectionately with shy embarrassment. Their ability to master their feelings was commendable. Throughout my three-year tenure on the council, girls continued hanging out with boys whose hobbies included graffiti and spitting, two habits I abhor to this day. But they were right. Declaring their love for a council member would have been a conflict of interests and inevitably led to suspicions of unfair influence and even foul play. But these suppressed feelings didn't go unnoticed by the lads they hung around with. Jealousy, ignorance and poor discipline on their part and an absolute lack of any wrongdoing whatsoever on mine led to a conflict. My weapon was words, a blade I still wield to this day. <laughs> Once... Whilst waiting for a humanities lesson, one of my nemeses approached, asking, Do you want a smack? And quick as a flash, I replied, No, I'm not that kinky. I had won the battle, but not the war. As soon as I regained consciousness, I made straight for the headmaster to lodge an official complaint. According to Facebook, he is now responsible for the financial maintenance of almost half a dozen children, and he works at a local mechanics less than a mile from his place of birth. Every six months, brackets 2005 to present, an interim service is booked by a customer who never appears. <laughs> the mystery is never solved. I may have a few leads, mine factual, his jump, but let's just say, with 18 biannual services unattended, I may just have won the war. So there you go, folks. There's the latest instalment of my autobiography, A Robin's Amongst the Pigeons. <laughs> Such a profoundly weird guy. <laughs> XFM. This week it's chapter five entitled Rebel with a Cause. Here we go. 1997 was a year in flux. The discovery of yachtsman Tony Bullimore on the 9th of January seemed to signal a year of rebirth and change. <laughs> For years, I had been a studious boy, ignoring the unspoken affections of girls and the inevitable rise of grunge music. But in my 14th year, I would finally show my true colours. Those colours were the rust brown and aqua blue of a tie-dyed Metallica top. 
I had never heard their music, but the design, a large skull emblazoned on a skull background with additional skull motifs, caught my eye. It seemed to encapsulate my suppressed flamboyance and emotional depth, and thus was the perfect choice for non-uniform day. I knew this garment would cause a stir, but I was never one to do things by halves. Quite the contrary, I do things by holes. I searched far and wide for suitable accompaniments and eventually settled on two studded leather bracelets and oh. matching leather dog collar. Oh. On entering the school bus that morning, the reaction was immediate. I may as well have been wearing an explosive vest. The silence that greeted me dripped with awe and admiration and lasted the entire journey. By the end of first lesson, that silence was well and truly broken. There was only one word on everyone's lips, and that word was Robin's. <laughs> Cries of what the... Well, producer Dave is having a nightmare this morning. We'll try that again. Cries of... Oh, good Lord. Cries of what the... Are you wearing? And leave him alone, someone call a teacher, rang out across the school. Ever the enigma, when break time arrived, I elected to stay in DT to finish a wooden box I'd been making. <laughs> Though I had pushed the boundaries of fashion, I was unwilling to breach health and safety regulations and removed my studded bracelets whenever I was within two metres of the belt sander. The reaction was so severe, I did the same during lunch, under the constant watch of a teacher who locked the door in order to help me concentrate. I left the other students to argue amongst themselves and hammer on the door and windows in a show of solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> By home time, I was exhausted. A girl approached me at the school gate. Are you a raver or a jitter or what? She barked. I knew neither term, but experience taught me they were probably both slang for a homosexual. Neither, I replied. What are you then? She asked, a crowd now forming. My reply was simple. I young lady, Amma Robbins. <laughs> and that, dear listener, has been my motto ever since. So there we go, team. <laughs> Chapter 5 of A Robbins Amongst the Pigeons. True story. <laughs> uh, t three words. Studded dog collar. And matching uh, leather studded bracelets. Oh, my. Where do you buy that stuff? In sort of alternative shops where you can buy incense and uh, marijuana paraphernalia. Oh, good It's like a goth shop. That, right. That was essentially my, my sort of coming out rock-wise. <laughs> it, it really did. It defined a generation at my school when I walked into school with the tie-dyed Metallica top and studded leather dog collar. Everyone else is just wearing, like, Adidas trainers. Yeah. <laughs> This chapter is called Spread Your Wings. It is said every singer has his song, and if I am a singer, and moments in time can be songs, then the autumn, of win the autumn and winter of 1998 were the first tracks on an album entitled John's Greatest Hits <laughs> 1. In my final year at secondary school, I was all out at sea. I had a collection of fashionable two-tone shirts, a pair of shiny pinstripe trousers, and a sh had shaved the hair from the sides of my head, leaving a bird's nest type effect on top, a style I had once observed on a road worker resurfacing the A38. <laughs> but alas, I was all dressed up with no place to go. That was until my first year at the Castle School sixth form. Sixth form wasn't just a place, it was a state of mind. <laughs> I had caught the attention of a group in the year above me who saw me smoking miniature cigars in a velvet jacket <laughs> outside my final GCSE exam. When I started upper school, they took me under their wings. It was refreshing to meet people who thought for themselves and didn't call you gay for reading. They were a motley crew, goths, hip-hop fans, indie music aficionados, and a girl who now works as a Southwest-based burlesque dancer. <laughs> and I felt right at home. I also began being invited to parties. I couldn't believe my luck. I'd been to one party before, but it turned out to be a thinly-veiled excuse for people to smoke drugs. I've never been a big fan of marijuana, street named The Herb, <laughs> and couldn't stomach the stuff. Once... I was sick in front of a girl I liked and passed out next to a field just off the A38. I was driven home by a good Samaritan in a Toyota Avensis. <laughs> Safe to say, I wouldn't be where I am today without 38, the A38. Quite literally, it is the only way out of Thornbury. 
No, these parties were erudite affairs. Imagine Paris in the 20s, New York in the 60s, but in Thornbury in the late 90s. At one such event, at the Commercial Rooms, a fashionable night bar where Cream once played, I actually kissed a girl. I had entered the venue without the help of a fake ID. I've always frowned upon fraud, and luckily my fur coat had caused such a stir amongst the bouncers <laughs> that they never asked for my documents. <laughs> Later on the dance floor, I found myself dancing with a tall girl who was one of the cool set. One thing led to another, and we ended up kissing tenderly for some minutes. I was elated. I had finally made it into the kissing cool girls fraternity. The next day, on arriving at school, it became clear she was mortified and never spoke to me again. Surely frustrated to have shown her true feelings in front of the whole gang. To quote the folk pop combo Simon and Garfunkel, sail on, silver girl. Sail on by. There you go, it's chapter six. Uh, chapter six of my autobiography, A Robin's Amongst the Pigeons, entitled Spread Your Wings. <laughs> Do you like that, Al? Do you learn any more about me? Uh, yeah, and the, the, the thing about you is that you're this sort of never-ending well of weirdness. <laughs> You've lived... People say, oh, he's lived nine lives. You've lived nine weird lives. <laughs> Not one of them was normal. I remember I had that fur coat for years. Oh, fur coat. A fake fur coat, obviously, ethics fans. Uh, until um, my cat weed on it and my mum threw it out. <laughs> FM, Ellis James and John Robbins podcast. So, uh, John, treat us to the latest chapter. Chapter 7 of A Robbins Amongst the Pigeons, entitled Oysters. <laughs> The winter of 1999 was a double-edged sword. Little did I know it would soon turn into a double-edged sword where both sides were bad. <laughs> Many of the friends I made at sixth form left for university. Though depressed, I was assured by teachers that I was a shoe-in to follow hot on their heels to the hallowed halls of Oxford University. As a star pupil, the teachers felt I needed no extra tuition for the notorious Oxford interviews, and I set off to Hartford College, hoping to impress with my essay on T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. I knew the standard would be high, so I added a footnote to the title, thanking the student's guide to T.S. Eliot, quote, without whom this essay would not have been possible. It was a classy move designed to win favour amongst the country's ac academic elite. My backup plan was the creative writing course at East Anglia University. Having sent them three poems about how depressed I was that girls didn't fancy me, I knew it was a safe bet. I had Bristol as my third choice, leaving three choices blank as an extra show of confidence. <laughs> the world was my oyster. I don't know if you've ever tasted an oyster. I have. Let me assure you they're the most disgusting creation ever dreamed up in the history of human insanity. <laughs> in December 1999, I received three letters of rejection. One from East Anglia. Had they not read my epic poem, The Dark Side of Depression? <laughs> Bristol. Rejecting an Oxford applicant? Are you insane? Bristol University is full of Oxford rejects. And finally, Oxford. My heart sank. My legs failed, and three darts I had been using to practice for the Oxford University darts team hit the floor. <laughs> so it was that I took an unplanned gap year. With no time to organise foreign travel, I worked part-time in a Virgin megastore. <laughs> During this period of rapid physical and mental decline, <laughs> I developed a crippling addiction to gambling, which I overcame, then relapsed into and then overcame again. <laughs> I then reapplied to Oxford. This time, my application was successful, for two reasons. Firstly, my teacher, Mr. Allender, gave up his spare time to give me extra tuition and interview preparation, a kindness I will never forget. And secondly, I lied in my application and interviews about the books I'd read. <laughs> Justice was restored. There you go, a little insight into uh, a dark year for Robbins. Oh, God, every week? <laughs> Every week you get weirder and weirder. <laughs> oh, Ellie, that's a very popular feature. Um, so many people tap me on the shoulder in the street and say, is your friend John all right? <laughs> <laughs> I go, yeah. It's they go, all come up roses. <laughs> if I could have told that 19-year-old working in Virgin Megastores, over, being overpaid by accident and then putting it all in a fruit machine and being very sad, that one day... He would be about to step on stage before Brian May and Roger Taylor. I actually I wouldn't have told it would have been too much for him. He'd have cried. He'd yeah. have gone mad. X -X -X -X. The chapter is entitled Oxford University. 
In October 2001, I finally began my studies at Oxford University. Oxford had a long history of notable alumni, and it was hard to believe that I was walking the very same streets as J.R.R. Tolkien, Oscar Wilde, T.S. Eliot, and Zena Badawi. I was to be a student at St. Anne's College. Their mix of fe female to male students was 50-50, and I was hopeful that if my attempt to woo a lady failed, then basic maths would come to my aid. <laughs> Freshers' week was a crucial period for making friends, but by now my Mohican was perilously thin, <laughs> and I decided to offset it with an eye-catching black velvet suit, courtesy of Jeff Banks. The combination was intoxicating. Its first outing was a karaoke night in the St Anne's College bar. Timing was crucial. I had to make a good impression. Halfway through proceedings, I saw my chance. The room was packed following a rousing version of ABBA's Dancing Queen. I saw my window, and standing stock still, gave a powerful spoken word rendition of Lou Reed's Perfect Day. <laughs> it couldn't have gone better. As soon as I began, people stopped dancing and took to their seats to discuss my performance amongst themselves. After I'd finished, some people went outside to take stock, and one girl described my version of Reed's classic as intense. <laughs> Given that I was studying Old English at the seat of learning, it seemed fitting that I should also take to smoking a pipe. <laughs> on frosty winter nights, I would puff away with a pint of ale on a solitary pilgrimage to the Eagle and Child pub, and, if the one friend who tolerated my habit was available, I'd go with him. <laughs> Oh, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? The, the, the combination of uh, velvet suit, looking smart, Mohican, edgy, alternative. What sort of Robins is this? That's what people would have been thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll say that, if I'd seen you in Freshers' Week, I would have avoided you. <laughs> that was That's, the net result that in is, many ways. That is, <laughs> That is, it's inconceivable, you know, I'd have been, oh, God, that the, the, the person I was sort of living next to, oh, go, oh, let's, let's go to the pub and let's see what's happening. Oh, there's a guy on stage singing, he's giving us a spoken word rendition of a Lurie song, wearing a, a velvet suit with a Mohican. Well, he's one to avoid, because I think we all know what sort of person he is. But you're not that sort of person, that's the crazy thing. But I think my, my teenage years and my early twenties, twenties, to my abbreviated twenty there, were it was just I was experimenting, <laughs> but you know all those influences are still there. They're just sort of not. They're not um, illustrated by clothing or haircut. No, no. I mean, it, deep down inside, I think in some ways I do still smoke a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, folks, um, part two of chapter eight, so chapter nine, the second half of uh, my Oxford University time will be at next week. So. Uh, do stick with us for that. Obviously, take some time off over the next six and a half days. Uh, don't do a marathon and then collapse. Uh, you hear some terrible stories about people doing that in Japan on computer <laughs> games. Um, so basically, live your normal life, but tune in again live. X. X FM. Chapter 10. Darts, John. <laughs> St Anne's College was blessed with a broad demographic of students, it attracted many people from the north of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So by the time I had finished there, I was well schooled in crime, unemployment and sectarian graffiti. <laughs> to this day, I have many friends from Wales and the north of England. My top tip for keeping northerners close is to never ever suggest they're not working class, no matter how much land their parents own. <laughs> I've tended to avoid the Northern Irish, though. Even in polite situations, their accent makes me feel under the constant threat of physical violence. I have one Northern Irish friend, and his accent is very mild. It's one of the cornerstones of our relationship. One result of this melting pot was the sheer array of activities you could involve yourself in. Not being from aristocracy, rowing wasn't an option. Rugby has always struck me as legitimised assault, and the Asian society was a closed shop. <laughs> So I signed up for the darts team. College darts was without doubt the greatest thing that has or ever will happen to me or anyone I know. Each Wednesday night we would host a team in our bar or disappear off into the lamplit alleyways of Oxford, searching out the college bar of our opponents. Heaven. <laughs> Players and fans were encouraged to shout abuse at the top of their voice constantly throughout the whole match. 
The only rule was that you couldn't touch or obstruct a player physically. As a result of this, the threat of violence was always bubbling under the surface. Combine this with a Northern Irish element and all hell could break loose. Our arch rivals were Wadham College. I'm not one to hold petty grudges, but anyone who has ever played darts for Wadham College are amongst the very worst people on earth. <laughs> on one occasion, Psycho Bob, a resident of Belfast, was berating me for missing treble twenties. I remained calm, hoping to let the darts do the talking. <laughs> My form was poor, though, and I fluffed a number of doubles to leave me on double five, a notoriously hard outshot. Where are your captain's darts now? He screamed, belittling my superior darting rank. I drew breath and threw one dart right into the heart of double five. That's captain's darts! I bellowed right into his stupid face. The room erupted and my team lifted me into the air. It was the greatest moment of my life. <laughs> uh, John, I've got to ask, you know you got double fives there? Yes. Is that a lie? No. Oh, wow. I was great at darts. I, yeah, well, that is true, actually. I've seen you play darts. Well, the thing was, I got... When I used to visit my friend at uni, I got obsessed with the idea that one day I would play for the darts team. So I spent my whole unplanned gap year practising in my mum's garage. Oh. The <laughs> oh. Classic Robbins. Um, and the sledging didn't put you off, you know, being called names. Did oh, you thrive under the pressure? I think it basically gave me the power I the, the sort of skill I have now to deal with it at gigs <laughs> yeah uh, yeah of course dealing with hecklers because people have been like oh you can't get bullseye you're an idiot anyway a slim idiot with thin arms <laughs> what it's one of my heckles for John come back to that after after the Foo Fighters <laughs> XFM Ellis James and John Robbins on XFM podcast folks this is chapter 11 of a Robbins amongst the pigeons <laughs> and it is called simply Seven Stars. Having conquered the darts world at Oxford, I was aware that I needed to fully exploit the old boys network I'd heard so much about. Though, I doubt as many alumni went on to claim working tax credits for quite as long as I did, <laughs> 2005 to 10. It had long been my ambition to become a poet, and having sent examples of my work about being depressed that girls didn't fancy me to a number of classes multiple times, I was eventually accepted on the prestigious Peter MacDonald poetry course. I was finally going to follow in the footsteps of Elliot, Larkin and Dunn. My first assignment was to write a poem in the Ottavarima form on the subject of myth. I decided to tackle the big one, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. I was sure I wouldn't be the only one to pay homage to this masterwork, so my effort had to be top-notch. It took me all week, and I set off for Christchurch College with 12 printed copies of my poem, entitled Seven Stars, Seven Stones and One White Tree. <laughs> the class was made up of postgraduates, many of whom were already published poets, but I wasn't intimidated. I'd been around in the poetry game for a while, too. It was now some years since I'd penned my masterpiece, The Dark Side of Depression. <laughs> and I'd written extensively on subjects such as autumn at primary school. Indeed, my peers from 5G considered me quite the expert on leaves, squirrels and frost. <laughs> the class took it in turns to read out their efforts. I have to say I was very impressed. In fact, I began to feel a little daunted. Many were covering Greek and Roman myths with a high level of linguistic complexity. I looked down at my poem and realised it contained a stanza where I had rhymed Bilbo with Elbow. <laughs> I began to panic. My face reddened as I chastised myself internally. You fool, John! You're going to look like a right idiot! Who writes a poem about Middle-earth, for Christ's sake? These people are serious and you've named over half a dozen dwarves! <laughs> my turn finally came. All eyes turned to the new guy. I knew I couldn't go through with it. I took the only course of action available to me. Feigning tears, I claimed that the emotions I had covered were still too raw. <laughs> and that I'd rather not read this week. <laughs> Luckily, they bought it. I walked back to college still armed with my 12 printed copies that I then destroyed in a ceremonial pyre in my ensuite sink. <laughs> it's an episode of my life that I often recall as it formed the basis of a recurring anxiety dream that I've now had for over a decade. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, good grief. Is there definitely not a copy still in existence? I've still got that poem. Oh, well, please. No. Nope. Come on, we're it, friends. No, I couldn't. It made my face burn just to read the title. <laughs> it's such... It's one of the most embarrassing things that's ever happened Well, to me. I will work on John uh, over the next few minutes. Uh, I talk of, about Tolkien we, sitting we, with a pipe and a pot of tea. We've <laughs> got... Got a track to play with. I will do what I can, listeners. That was uh, John reading that from his autobiography. X. X. FM. Chapter 12. Civvy Street. <laughs> Walking out of my final exam at Oxford University was bittersweet. On the one hand, I'd been able to write more confidently on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales than I had expected. On the other hand, I immediately felt a terrible sense of loss and regret that I feared would last the rest of my life and has. <laughs> When I speak to other people about their time at university, they describe it as an enjoyable period which set them up for the rest of their lives. Lives they spend happily updating Facebook with photos of their children no one cares about. <laughs> Seriously, guys, if I wanted to spend all my time browsing photos of children online, I'd get a job at Radio 1. <laughs> for me, university wasn't just a phase of my life. It was my life. Amongst the 400 or so students at my college, I was a somebody. I was Mohican John. Then following a haircut, Nohican John. I was John the darts captain, John the poet, John the guy hunched over a bar stool sobbing. Seriously, never attempt to drink 200 shots of cider in 100 minutes. It can really cause unresolved dad issues to bubble up. <laughs> When I arrived home, however, I felt alone and isolated, like a soldier returning from war, but an enjoyable war, <laughs> like Robot Wars, <laughs> or the Falklands. <clears throat> Luckily, like all Oxbridge graduates, I was destined for a career at the very highest echelons of society, and within weeks I'd started work as an inventory supervisor at Borders Bookshop, <laughs> now defunct. It wasn't quite the home office, but I played an essential role in making sure the latest releases and back catalogue favourites were unpacked and processed correctly in one of Bristol's leading booksellers. Some suggested I'd underachieved, but who was it that alerted authorities when a photoshopping error allowed an unfinished wiring to remain on the cover image of Grand Designs Abroad? Hardback. That's right, Robbins. My quick thinking saved both BBC Publishing and presenter Kevin MacLeod a scandal that could have rocked them to their very core. <laughs> MacLeod went on to receive an MBE, a fellowship from the Royal Institute of Architects, and an honorary degree from Oxford Brooks. Don't worry, Kevin. Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> John, now I know I always come back to this. I didn't think the Mohican was a university thing. That is surely the thing you do when you're in year 10? Uh, it, it, I had it for my first term at university. Oh, good grief, but that's when you make your friends, John. <laughs> they People made... will have thought you liked System of a Down. They met Mohican John and they fell in love with Nohican John. <laughs> Some were creeped out by him. Yes, yeah, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I thought uh, your job after university was um, working in Portbury Docks when people used to wrap you in bubble wrap and then hit you. No, that was uh, uh, that was during university. <laughs> oh, I forgot to... I've forgotten that. <laughs> oh, slash blacked out that <laughs> chapter of my life. I remember driving to a gig with you uh, in Somerset and we, we drove past Portbury Docks years ago and you pointed out some people used to wrap me in bubble wrap then and sort of knock me about a bit and I went, yeah... <laughs> It was still it was good probably, bill tonight. Looking forward to it. It's probably the worst. Yeah, it's when I relapsed my gambling problem. Well, Dave <laughs> is doing the timeout sign. For What's run out of petrol? Because I spent it all on the fruit machines at the uh, service station. Oh, I love great doing, days. I love doing this show. Um, <laughs> X FM. Chapter twelve. Standing up to my rock bottom. Working at Borders Bookshop, now defunct, was all well and good. The 25% discount on non-sale stock reserved for employees and local VIPs such as Tony <laughs> Robinson and Charlie from Casualty <laughs> was a welcome perk. However, I craved the attention I'd garnered from hosting college karaoke nights, the acclaim of the darts fraternity and an income of more than £5.60 per hour. <laughs> I decided to take the comedy world by storm. After a good afternoon's graft, which included emailing newsreader Alistair Stewart, the father of a mutual friend, I became jaded with the comedy world, which seemed to me to be so much BS. 
<laughs> I was hitting the booze pretty hard, and one night crashed a private party at a local bar. I ordered a Guinness, and seeing that it was only ten minutes until the beginning of Lent, I decided to, <laughs> I decided to up the ante with a whiskey before quitting drink at midnight in the name of Christ. <laughs> I have always despised whiskey, but loved the aesthetic of it sat next to a cold stout. <laughs> Not wanting to mar my Lenten oath, I drained the whiskey at 11.59pm and was immediately sick into my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Running to the toilet through what turned out to be a redding, wedding reception, I realised I had hit rock bottom. I didn't drink again for nearly two years. In order to fill the time, I headed down to my local open mic comedy night and vowed to return the next week with a set to try out. There were no reviewers at my first gig, but had there been, I can only imagine they would have written something like this. <laughs> <laughs> Easily the pick of the night was handsome debutante John Robbins. He made it clear that he was once bar rep on the JCR committee at St Anne's College, Oxford. Some of the audience were reluctant to grant him the respect this position clearly <laughs> demanded. But this experienced reviewer was keen to hear more. He regaled us with a hilarious story about leaving 360 CDs in the street after hosting the annual St Anne's College Oxford Bar Oscars. It was gloriously unplanned, and as a result, he overran by a satisfying ten minutes. <laughs> His scripted material dealt with fresh topics such as charity muggers, actual muggers, and the Boxing Day tsunami. One to watch, five stars, a genius in the making. John, you weren't drinking, I met you around this time obviously, and you weren't drinking then, and I asked you once, probably the second time I met you, I said, John, why, why don't you drink? And you went, because I used to drink whiskey and watch Woody Allen films on my own. <laughs> Ellis James and John Robbins podcast. XFM. On XFM. Chapter 13, Finger Mouse. My first stand-up gig was on the 27th of February 2005. By early March, I had conquered the world of Bristol's open mic scene at the Hatchet Pub on a Sunday, and I needed to explore further afield. Experienced comedians rushed to advise me, keen to keep this young firebrand on the scene. The last thing they needed was to lose comedy's most promising new talent to Hollywood or face modelling. <laughs> I was offered a spot at a pub called the Yellow Kangaroo in Cardiff. I jumped at the chance. With only one gig under my belt, I was already being selected to perform abroad. I edited my set, checked the oil in my car, and booked in at the health centre to get my jabs. On arrival, I saw a table of comedians rifling through their notebooks. I sat down and silence fell. Word had clearly spread of my first gig. Hi, I'm John, I said, straightening the lapels of my suit jacket. A homeless drifter offered me his hand. He was clearly friends with one of the acts. I was reluctant to take it, but always the Samaritan, and with a secure knowledge that I'd already been inoculated for all known Welsh diseases, I shook it. <laughs> he moved aside a dishevelled fringe to reveal a drawn face that immediately brought to mind short-lived 1985 children's TV puppet Finger Mouse. He looked to me with malnourished eyes and whispered four words that would change the course of my life forever. Hiya, mate. I'm Ellis. With hindsight, I now know his thread-thin voice wasn't due to self-neglect, but rather cripplingly poor voice projection, a disability he still carries with him to this day. I was eager to see what his comedy was like, and as the applause died down following my Welsh debut, Ellis James took to the stage. After his trademark awkward opening, see YouTube, <laughs> he proceeded to tell me one of the funniest stories I have ever heard. It concerned smuggling scissors into his secondary school that were deemed, quote, too sharp by his peer group. It was the best routine Ellis James had ever or would ever write. <laughs> and for those of us who were there, it's the Ellis James we'll remember. When I see him now on BBC Three's Crimes, I'm reminded of that young boy with so much potential. Ironically, on the night we first met in 2005, he was a full five years older than the character he would later portray <laughs> over a decade later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, John. I know that um, I know that your girlfriend advised you to take out some of the more description, some of the more ugly descriptions of me. That's true, <laughs> because you described me as looking verminous. And your girlfriend <laughs> yes, said, and she that's... said that was a bit harsh. <laughs> well, that's fine. You can you can say what you want. I'm very glad. Um, I'm, I just need to say this. You were wearing a suit jacket, yeah. and I'd only ever seen a pop star do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I assumed. She I assumed you were in a band. She also advised me to take out references 
to specific YouTube clips. <laughs> But it's almost ten years, nearly, since I first met you. Ten years. Ten long years. <laughs> ten long years. Right, well, there'll be more uh, of John's autobiography next week. X. X. FM. A Robins Amongst the Pigeons. Chapter 14. Busy Earning. <laughs> In t- spring 2005, I quit my job at Borders Bookshop, now defunct. Impulsive, yes. Brave, perhaps. <laughs> Financially naive, no way. I had carried out a thorough audit and had four to six weeks of savings to bridge the gap between open mic amateur and professional comedian. A widely bath-based promoter by the name of Jeff Whiting had seen my potential and booked me for unpaid work in clubs as diverse as Plymouth Fandangos, <laughs> Exeter Havana and <laughs> Queen's Hall Minehead. The latter of these was a watershed moment. As I took to the stage, every eye was on me. An audience of 14 may sound small, but that's a total of 28 eyes. <laughs> I used a mix of local references, improvised riffs and proven material. The combination was a winner. Afterwards, the landlord approached me and said seven words that would change the course of my life. I can't not pay you for that. Unapologetic for his use of a double negative, (laughs) he shook my hand, leaving a £20 note folded in my palm, like a mob boss or antique dealer. (laughs) Words failed me, and my eyes filled with tears. I walked out to the seafront and looked over the vast ocean before me. Not just the physical ocean, the Bristol Channel, but an ocean of possibility. Taking into account petrol and food, I was technically down £17 on the (laughs) night as a whole, But all I had to do was earn ten times as much per gig, four nights a week, and I was home free. On returning to the open mic scene, I made sure to mention my new status as a professional comedian as often as possible. It was crucial that Ellis James et al. knew I was now operating in a different realm. I skillfully dropped in references to Plymouth, Exeter, and the £20 note in Minehead. They were agog. I may as well have been Columbus describing the new world. (laughs) From that day forth, I was a full-time comedian and my income came entirely from laughter, save temping jobs, manual labour, data entry parents, working tax credits, loans and debt. I vowed to frame that £20 note, a memento I would look back on in years to come. However, it simply wasn't financially viable and I spent it on rent and fags. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that brings it all back. I did that gig at Queen's Head in Minehead. I yeah. like, only got £10. Yeah. In an envelope, £10, comedian, brackets, Ellis James. How come you got 20 Because of the standard oh, d- difference. Thanks. We had an email in to say that someone had caught me and Ellis live uh, after listening to the show. And yes. uh, I quote, Robbins was slightly ahead on star rating. Yes, very good. You're the best. I get it. Although he told me which gig he'd see me at and I wasn't on top form because I was tired. I remember the first gig back after that Minehead and I remember... I remember mentioning it too many times and another comedian going, Oh, my name's John Robbins. I've been to Minehead. (laughs) (laughs) FM, Ellis James and John Robbins podcast. So that was the first instalment of the complete Robbins Monks the Pigeons and we'll be back with another episode of it, 